Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis and Charles Boyer in All This and Heaven Too. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Some years ago, I owned a little white house on a hill high above Hollywood and rented it to a young lady who was just getting started in pictures. She always paid the rent on time and was in every respect a model tenant. It became increasingly evident as the Academy Awards piled up that she was a model actress, too. Her name was Betty Davis. I've never been Charles Boyer's landlord, but I've admired his great talent ever since he came to Hollywood. And so we believe tonight is one of the really great nights in the history of the Lux Radio Theater, because we've brought these two together in all this and heaven, too. Warner Brothers produced the screen success, but before that, Rachel Field's novel was a bestseller for almost two years. It's a strange story. You've never heard one quite like it. A mixture of tenderness and violence, of love and hate, of jealousy and sacrifice. A mixture that explodes with an impact you'll remember for weeks to come. Every play in the Lux Radio Theater is a national one-night stand. <laughs> Just imagine what would happen if some Broadway theater advertised Betty Davis and Charles Boyer in All This and Heaven Too for one night only. There'd be a riot at the box office. But Lux Flakes has saved the riot squad a lot of trouble tonight by bringing this dramatic treat right into your own home. That's the reward you've earned by bringing Lux Flakes into your own home. Unless you're one of those lonely souls who haven't tried these magic flakes yet. If you are, well, you're just not getting full value out of this theater until you've tried uh, all this and Lux Flakes, too. The curtain rises for the first act of All This and Heaven, too, starring Charles Boyer as the Duke de Prelat and Betty Davis as Henriette Desportes. Tell you she's Mademoiselle D. Who's Mademoiselle D? Why, she's notorious. It was the awfulest scandal in France. But what did she do? Oh, nothing. She was just mixed up in a murder, that's all. It's the year 1850. Through the classrooms of Miss Haynes' school for girls in New York runs a whisper of suspicion, of scandal, of hate. In guarded tones, the girls speak of the new French teacher, Mademoiselle Henriette Desportes. Desportes. Her real name's De Luzy. She has yet to teach her first class, but already judgment has been passed upon her. Now the door to the classroom opens, and Mademoiselle Desportes enters. She's nervous and frightened. By her side is the principal, Miss Haynes. Quiet, please. Young ladies, it is with great pleasure that I've come here this morning to introduce you to your new instructress in French, Mademoiselle Henriette Desportes. I'm glad to welcome her to our little school, and I trust that you will have the good sense to profit by her teaching. You may take over, Mademoiselle. Thank you, Miss Haynes. Bonjour, Mademoiselle. J'ai été mise ici comme votre maîtresse. Avant la fin de l'année, j'espère que je serai devenue votre amie. And in your language, good morning, young ladies. I have been placed here as your teacher, but before the year is out, I hope I will have become your friend. Well, so much for that. You will open your literature books to page one, please. I will select at random from the roll. Agnes Brevoort, will you start reading, please? George. She doesn't look like a murderer, does she? My sister told me all about it. There was a duke or something mixed up in it. His name was Prelin. Prelin? He was married and she... Watch out, she's looking at me. Anyway, she went to prison. I know that. Just a moment, please. That young lady over there. What is your name, please? Emily Schuyler. Mademoiselle Schuyler, you seem to be doing a good deal of talking. Perhaps you have a question. Oui, mademoiselle. But I'm not sure that you'll like to answer it. 
What is it, please? Could you tell me how you spell conciergerie? I beg your pardon? I'm asking you how you spell conciergerie. I uh, think it's the name of a French prison. Why do you wish to know? I mean, that particular word. You said yourself we were here to learn. Oh, of course. Conciergerie. C O N C I E. And then you might tell us how you spell the name Pralin. If, if you'll all excuse me, please. Did you see her face when she went out? She was white, absolutely white. I hope she's gone for good. Emily, how did you ever dare say those things? I think it's a disgrace sending a, a woman like that to teach us. I'm going to tell my parents. Oh, look out, she's coming back. Shh. The rest of the lesson will be conducted in English today. You may lay aside your books, for it is going to be entirely oral. I am going to tell you a true story. Perhaps I am wrong in telling it to you. You are so young, so sheltered. But in a few years, you will be women of an age to love and suffer and face difficult problems. All I ask is that you give me your whole attention and do your part faithfully when I call upon you for comments. For most of our story, we will be in Paris, in a large and beautiful house, the residence of the Duke and Duchess de Prelin. It is of the governess in this household, I shall tell you. On a February morning some years ago, the governess was just coming to take up her position there. She had come from England, and in the bag she carried was a letter of recommendation from her last employer. She could not know into what unexpected adventure the letter would carry her. And even more, how another letter would one day bring her world down in ruins. She found the house, a fashionable section of Paris. She walked through the heavy iron gates, and rang the bell of the great front door. Then an old man who was sweeping the courtyard stopped his work and spoke to her. Are you thinking of joining this household, mademoiselle? I hope I'm to be the new governess. Hope, did you say? You would not enter this house of your own free will? You find that <laughs> amusing? <laughs> yes, yes, quite amusing. You see, young lady, I not only sweep the courtyard, but I wash the windows as well, and I see a good deal. I'm old Pierre, the handyman, and there are things I could tell you. <laughs> Many things. Yes? I'm expected. Henriette de Port. Oh, yes. Follow me, mademoiselle. Thank you. Everyone in this house knows the pleasure you take in humiliating me. I have no wish to humiliate you, Francis. My decision... It is every day of my life humiliation. I'm your wife. We're both young and yet oh, we... Please, in the name of your pride, Francis... Come in. Mademoiselle Henriette de Porte. Madame la Duchesse, I trust I am not too early. Really, I... What time is it? Uh, you asked me for 11, but if I am inconveniencing you, madame... Please make yourself comfortable, mademoiselle. Would you sit down here, please? Uh, thank you, monsieur le duc. Uh, madame, please allow me to express my gratitude for the compliment you've paid in summoning me to discuss your children's education. I sent you my letter of reference yesterday... I hope it was satisfactory. The reference? Oh, yes, quite so. As I remember, it was excellent. There must, of course, be much more that you would wish to know about me. I, for my part, should wish to know more about the children and what is expected of me. Well, the requirements are about the same as your last position, Mademoiselle Desportes. We want a governess to take full charge of the children's education and supervise their music, drawing, and behavior. I'm afraid there'll be quite a handful we have three girls. They are at that difficult age from 7 to 13. I understand, monsieur. Then there is a boy who was born some years later. Reynald, who is not quite four. Oh, he's a bright little fellow, but his health... Reynald is sensitive, like me. For years before he was born, I was made ill and unhappy. And he'll always bear the marks of my suffering. Please, Francis. I think we can bring this interview to a close, Mademoiselle Desportes. In view of your excellent reference... A trial of the post is yours, if you would like it. Before you commit yourself, monsieur... Oh, this is very awkward. If I come, I shall have to ask you to call me by some other name than Deport. 
Am I to understand that your name is not Deport? My grandfather, the Baron Deport, received his title from Napoleon during the First Republic, so naturally he is opposed to my associating myself in a household of such prominent friends of the present king. Well, I confess this is an awkward situation. Mademoiselle? De Luzy, I, I chose that name to keep my initials intact. So this is what comes of your wanting to make a change, Theo. We're to take in someone to teach republicanism to our children. I give you my word, madame, that I would not allow my political beliefs to affect my teaching of your children. But if these things make a difference in your feeling, I would understand. Oh, that must be the children. I asked Mademoiselle Maillard to bring them by to meet you. Does that seem necessary now, Theo? Papa, Papa! We Papa, 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 Come in, children. Come in, Mademoiselle Maillard. Children, children, you will be quiet. Yes, your poor mother's nerves will be shattered. Uh, Mademoiselle Maillard, this is Mademoiselle de Luzy. Mademoiselle. Come on, come, make your curtsies, children. This long-legged colt is Isabel, the eldest. Why, Isabel, you're already a young lady. Yes, mademoiselle. And my little Louise. Louise, what lovely hair for curling. Oh, may I curl my hair? Mademoiselle Mayar says I can. Louise, of course not one of you children is so much as said good morning to your mother. Good morning, good morning Mama. Mama. Good heavens, child, don't spill Mama's ink. But Mademoiselle Mayar, I'm not spilling, I'm drawing. You're such a beautiful child. Yes, a little headstrong, but, but very lovable, if one can win her over. No, Renaud, Renaud, come away from there at once, you bad, bad boy, to pick Mama's flower. Oh, she should not. For that, you will stay at home today when we drive to the guignol. Whatever made you do such a thing? It was for Mademoiselle to put on her dress. Oh, well, that was kind, Renaud, a very kind thought, but you should have asked Mama's permission first. Perhaps if you do so now, she will let you give it to me. But it wasn't for you. I picked it for the new mademoiselle because she has pink ribbons in her bonnet. Oh, I see. In heaven's name, let him give it to her and take them all out of here. You may give it to the new mademoiselle if you wish. Here, mademoiselle. Thank you, Renaud. But I think since it is your mama's flower, it would be nice if you gave it to her. Do you? Do you want it, mama? Just put it down, Renaud. Mademoiselle May, I please. Yes, madame. Come, children. Can we well, sit in the All right, children. Back to the schoolroom. <coughs> I'll come in and see you at lunchtime. Well, Mademoiselle de Luzy, one never knows how a new person will fit into a household, but I like your way with children, and they seem to like you. Uh, would it be possible for you to report in the morning? It is very kind of you, monsieur, but I can't come at all unless I feel I have madame's approval as well as yours. It really doesn't concern me one way or the other. Monsieur has taken over the children's education. He knows I was thoroughly satisfied with Mademoiselle Maillard since she's proved her loyalty and affection. Until tomorrow then, Mademoiselle, and I hope you will be with us for a long time. Thank you, Monsieur. Mademoiselle de Lucie. Yes, Madame. How old are you? Twenty-five, Madame. Hmm. So young. But then we favor young governesses, don't we, Theo? This way, Mademoiselle. Don't trouble, Monsieur. I can find my way out. Good day, Madame. Good day. Don't leave me, Theo. Oh, how angry you are with me. I'm late at the palace, Mrs. I must talk to you. I never see you. The king expects Does me. Does even the touch of my hands fill you with aversion? Oh, really, Francis? It must be aversion you feel, since you always avoid me. If you never willingly give me a moment's thought or attention. I have no wish to avoid you, Francis. I would talk to you by the hour, if we could do so with calmness and sanity. But it always ends the same. Oh, wait, Theo. Oh, how cruel you are. Take the children. Take them. You know I care nothing about them, about anyone but you. If I promise, I'll never again torment you with my anger and my mistrust. If I promise... You don't know what you're saying. Theo! Oh, I hate you. I loathe you. You're wicked. Wicked. And then the fairy godmother spoke. It is within my power to give you happiness while you are young or happiness when you are old, she said. Which did the princess take? Bert, be quiet. You're always saying something. Go on, mademoiselle. The princess pondered in deep thought. It is a hard choice, dear godmother. But if I spend my share of happiness while I am young, then I shall have nothing left to look forward to. So let me have my happiness when I am old, and may heaven send me patience. And do you agree she made the right choice? Papa, tell me the truth. Come now, come. I asked you a question. Louise, 
Was the princess right to wait until she was old to get her happiness? No, I think she was foolish to wait so long. Couldn't she ask for a little when she was young and a little when she was old? <laughs> Our bed shows early signs of diplomacy. Ah, but it's not so easy as all that, is it, mademoiselle? No, it is not so easy as all that. Happiness isn't a little cake which we can cut up to fit our appetite. No, that's true. Uh, mademoiselle, forgive me for interrupting. Is it time for lessons now? Yes, monsieur. The girls have their history, and Reynald is about to retire into a corner with his alphabet and his sniffles. What is this? Sniffles? Reynald didn't invite them, Papa. They just came. <laughs> well, send them away then. The same way Mademoiselle is about to send me. Oh, don't go, Papa. I must, dear. Uh, Mademoiselle, may I see you outside? Of course, Monsieur. Goodbye, children. Goodbye, Goodbye Papa. Papa. Goodbye, Goodbye Mademoiselle. Mademoiselle. Goodbye. Yes, Monsieur. Uh, about these sniffles. Is it a cold, you think? It is too early to say. I'll keep him indoors today. I think he'll be all right. Oh, good. Uh, Mademoiselle... There is something I've wanted to say to you for a long time. If I've fallen short in any way, monsieur. Do you know, we had almost forgotten what peace was until you came into this house. I can't tell you how much it means to me. But really, monsieur, they're such good children. Hmm. How foolish my fears seem now. Fears, monsieur. Over you, because you were a stranger. From now on, my only fear will be that someday you will take it into your head to leave us. I should never be so foolish as all that, monsieur. For as long as the children need me, and you wish me to stay. Thank you. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Now, children, once again. With this seven Henry, the roses unite. His was the red, his wife's was the white. Oh, there, darling. The song is to learn history, too, not to dance, too. <laughs> Come now, we'll try it once more. Mademoiselle. Oh, good afternoon, madame. I apologize for intruding upon your domain, Mademoiselle de Luzy. On the contrary, madame, we all wish you would visit us more often. I only trespass now because I was sure this was where I'd find monsieur. He spends so much time lately with the children. He just went out, mama. Will it please you to sit down and join our history lesson, madame? Not at all. I had planned on taking a drive with Monsieur. Well, I'm not going alone for all the world to see. Dress Reynald, I'll be waiting at the carriage. Oh, I'm sorry, madame, but Reynald can't go out this afternoon. What did you say? He has coughed once or twice, madame. It may be a cold. Do I understand that you forbid me to take Reynald, Mademoiselle de Lucy? Oh, no, madame, but it's such a raw afternoon, and Monsieur himself agrees... Is it among the numerous authorities conferred upon you by Monsieur that you dictate to me concerning my own children? If I spoke hastily, madame, it is out of concern for Reynald. Sincerely, I meant no offence. If you will only choose one of the other children... Dress Reynald at once. I'm still mistress in this household, Mademoiselle de Lucy. Yes, madame. <laughs> now, now, Reynald, you're not afraid of the doctor, are you? Mademoiselle, I want Mademoiselle. I'm here, Sherry. This hurts, Reynald, I know. But just once more, open your mouth. Monsieur, would you rather wait outside? No, no, I want to be here. Poor little fellow. The treatment for diphtheria is always painful, monsieur. He should never have gone out. Never. There, Reynald. We're all finished. That's what's so bad now, was it? And here's your lunch as a reward, Reynald. The throat is badly inflamed. We can only hope to check it from spreading. Remember what I told you about the windows. Keep them closed, tight. Yes, doctor. Uh, I'll be back sometime this evening. See that it remains quiet. Mademoiselle... My neck hurts. Of course it does, darling. Here now. We're going to have our déjeuner on a tray, the same way your mama has hers. Chocolate? No, it hurts my neck. Then we'll forget about the chocolate. Try to sleep, Renald. My head is loose, mademoiselle. Lean against me. There. Mademoiselle, will I die and have to take nasty medicine? What an idea. You will probably have to take medicine to make you better. But we don't think about dying. But my white rabbit died, and I loved it better than the brown one that didn't. Hush, darling. You're going to sleep now. That's right. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Poor little Reynold. He's so pale. It seems a shame to shut out the air and the sunlight, especially with a warm spring coming. Yes, it does seem a shame. Mademoiselle, 
You must know the thanks I feel for what you're doing. When Madame understands, I'm sure she will be grateful too. Well, Doctor? Watch him. Keep him quiet and well covered. That is all any of us can do now. I expect the ultimate change for better or worse before night. We can only hope his strength will carry him through the crisis. Mademoiselle. Yes, Renard. It's so dark. The window. No, darling, the doctor thinks not yet. Perhaps tomorrow. What is it he wants so much? He complains of the dark and the closeness. Yes, it is stifling in here. He won't believe me when I tell him how green the garden has grown and that the almond tree is really in bloom. He begs to look out. And if I had my way, I'd let him. The garden, Papa? Sick or well, we are not meant to suffocate in this world. Just one time. It's a very mild day, Monsieur, and such a little thing to ask. It will give him a new interest in life to see the garden. And after all, the sun and air are good for every living thing. Well, I don't know why I should have more confidence in your world than the doctor's. Yet I do. I'll take him up. Come, Renald. He's no weight at all. Bring him over here, monsieur. You see, Renald? The almond tree breathes in the sunshine and the soft spring air. And every day it grows more strong and beautiful. Look, it's like a miracle. He's opening his eyes. And that is the way you must grow, Reynald. Strong and beautiful. Strong, Reynald. Theo, are you mad? Do you want to kill him, mademoiselle? Give me that child. Let him alone, do you hear me? Let him be. You're hurting me. My arm. Now go. Go, do you hear? If he dies tonight, it'll be your punishment. God will visit his revenge upon this house. Renat, darling, hush. We will look at the almond tree again tomorrow. If only you'll promise to try to get better. Oh, try, Cherie. Try hard, Renat. After a brief intermission, Betty Davis and Charles Boyer bring you the second act of All This and Heaven Too. Now, we're going to whisk you straight away to the home of the Seldons. James Seldon is just getting home from a trip. Hello, Pooch. Where's our missus? I got a surprise for her. Is that you, James? Hello, Nona. How about a kiss? You're late. And do you always have to bang the door like that when you come in? Oh, I'm sorry, Nona. I was hurrying to... Why, what's the matter, Nona? Darling. Darling, look up at me. You've been crying. Your eyes are all red and swollen. Red and swollen. Everything seems to be red and swollen. Just look at my hands. I look like a dishpan drudge because we can't afford a maid. At the bridge club this afternoon, I was so humiliated. The other girls' hands were so white and nice. And mine were red and rough and ugly. Poor Jim. How he wished that he could afford a maid for Nona so she wouldn't get her pretty hands all red and rough. But wait a moment. That night, Jim and Nona were listening to the radio, and they heard... And so hundreds of women made laboratory tests of six well-known dishwashing soaps, putting one hand in new quick luck suds, the other hand in suds from one of the other soaps. They did this three times a day for weeks. The Lux hands remained smooth, soft, and lovely. The other hands grew red, rough, unattractive. So in spite of dishwashing, you can have soft white hands if you use gentle Lux. Jim, that's what I'll do. You mean change to Lux? Yes, and I bet I fool those women at the club. They'll think we've gotten a maid. Well, it won't be long now before Nona's hands lose the red dishpan look that embarrasses her so. And your hands, are they as soft and youthful as you'd like to have them? Well, don't take chances. You'd never use a harsh soap on your face. Don't use it in your dishpan, where it can roughen and coarsen your hands very quickly. New Quick Lux Flakes have no harmful alkali. They're fast, thrifty, and so kind to your hands. Get that thrifty big box tomorrow and use it for your dishwashing every day. We pause now for station identification. 
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act Two of All This and Heaven Two, starring Charles Boyer as the Duke de Prelat and Betty Davis as Henriette Desport. <laughs> Standing before her class in Miss Haynes' school, the notorious Mademoiselle D continues her story. In a quiet voice, she tells them of a governess in a French home, a girl admired by the master, loved by the children, and hated by the mistress. Renald lived somehow through that night, and the next, and the one after. And then at last he began to grow stronger, and they knew the danger was past. <clears throat> Madame la Duchesse left the house to visit her father in Corsica, and when she returned, her father was with her, the Marechal Sebastiani. Together they accused the governess of stealing the love of the Duke and the children. It was not true, of course, but the suspicion was enough to make the governess leave. Her trunk was already packed when Monsieur le Duke pleaded with her to stay. She did stay against her better judgment. From that night on, life was horrible in that house. Good evening, Monsieur. Who are you? I am Charpentier. Charpentier? Your new valet, monsieur. Since when are you my new valet? Since this evening, monsieur, when the Maréchal Sebastiani was kind enough to employ me. Oh, the Maréchal, how do you? Yes, monsieur. How thoughtful of the Maréchal. Shall I prepare you for bed now, monsieur? No, thank you. I'm quite capable of preparing myself for bed. Is there anything I can do for you, monsieur? Yes, you can get out. Tell your master the Maréchal I will give him a complete report of my activities in the morning. But... Get out! Yes, monsieur. It was always like that. Servants spying, suspicion, hatred. Early that fall, the family was to leave for the country house in Merlin. Madame refused to go. I won't go. Not with that woman you've chosen to replace me Please, with. Francis. There were tears and threats. I put myself out of your way. I'll never trouble you again. I'll kill myself. <laughs> And the governess left with the children. They stayed at Melun for a few weeks. And then the Duke arrived alone. One evening, after the children were asleep, he and the governess sat laughing over some silly joke. The Duke was in a very gay humor. <laughs> you see, I can conceal nothing. Even an old friend reminds me that I am next door to being a grandfather. Monsieur, that's ridiculous. Here at Melun, you're the youngest child of all. Why shouldn't I be? Mademoiselle, don't we all like to hark back to the time when we were the happiest? Here at Melun, I can forget. But what about you? We've always talked about the children. It's been Mademoiselle this and Monsieur that. There's been so much I've wanted to know about you. What shall I say? Well, did you, did you have a happy childhood? Well, I was alone. There was my grandfather, but he never quite forgave me for having been born. He had his reasons. Was that uh, why you became a governess? Because you were alone? I've often wondered. Since I love children, what better? Marriage? You would grace any home. I can never marry, monsieur. Can you tell me why you say that? There is some mystery in my birth, just what grandfather would never tell me. Either his son married someone beneath him, or, or it was worse than that. It hasn't always been pleasant to live with this blank in my life. I feel like one of those silhouettes artists cut from black paper. Just the outlines of a person standing against nothing. How dreadful for you. Oh, forgive me. I really don't want to make you feel sorry for me. I have the children, and if they're not mine, I sometimes imagine they are. And when I tuck them into bed and know they will wake up in the morning still loving me, life is good. Well, of course, I should not quarrel with the good fortune that brought you to our house... But as your friend, I could wish you something quite different. What, monsieur? Well, it would make me most happy to think of you seated in a chair before your own fire, with your own children, 
playing near at hand, and your own husband looking at you and counting his blessings. Th thank you, monsieur. I must go up to the children now. No, please don't go. Don't even move. Why? Oh, I might say don't move because as you sit there, the firelight is so beautiful on your hair. I might say don't move because it is All Souls Day and you mustn't disturb the spirits. And then again, I might say don't move because this is a moment so full of understanding that I can't bear to have it come to an end. Monsieur, you're very kind, I but... know, I know you're tired. It's been a long day. No, I'm not tired. I'm frightened. Would you have preferred I hadn't come here to Milan? Oh, no, and I can't deny it's been beautiful here these few days. And I've tried not to think of... Not to think of the accounting you will have to give. Whatever comes, I promise you that you will not have to face it. This time, I can't help feeling that you will pay dearly. I always pay. Sometimes I pay most for what I never had. It is not unfair that for a few days I have had what it is beyond my power to ever pay for. I beg you, monsieur. These few hours, this little glimpse of what life might have been, I haven't asked for more. No. And if it had been only one hour or one minute, it would have been worth throwing away everything for. Knowing that it could never last. It will last, as long as it is remembered. Monsieur? Who is that? Monsieur, forgive me, but the Maréchal and Madame la Duchesse have arrived. Where would you go? I don't know. Or yet, let's be practical. You know the fix you're in as well as I do. A governess has only one stock in trade, and that's her good name. You threw yours away. Surely you don't believe that. Well, when I was young, they used to say that people only threw stones at trees that were loaded with fruit. But I'm an old friend of yours, and I believe you instead of gossip. But no one else will ever believe you until you produce a letter from the Duchess. She promised me a letter. Yes, so you've told me. Let me see. That was November. This is August. I've written to her over and over. Hand me such a letter, and I'll see you get work. Without it, you'll never work any place. I know. What does Monsieur Le Duc have to say about all this? I have told him. You haven't? Well, you'd better, young lady, or I will. Oh, no. Why didn't you let me know? Why? Please, Monsieur, if Madame Le Maire hadn't interfered... Well, it was time someone interfered. You would have gone on lying to me, pretending you had a position here with her. I didn't want you to know. You have enough trouble. And I kept hoping Madame would send the letter. I wrote so many times. When did you write last? What did she say? She never replied. Yes, that would be her answer. When the weak are also cruel, we should beware of them, my friend. The weak know how to use their power. They've got fat, white hands with which to squeeze and squeeze. Mrs. Stop, you frighten me. I? I frighten you? The look on your face. Oh, is it as noticeable as that, that I'm going mad? Please, please, let's forget the letter. I'll manage. Come to the house tomorrow. Come at two o'clock. No, no, I'll go back to England. Monsieur, I'll do anything. Come only... tomorrow. I promise you, you'll have the letter. Open the door. Open up here. What is it, please? Police. Are you Henriette de Luzy? Yes. Then come with me. Come along. But why you can't arrest me without telling me? I what... can tell you. The Duchess de Pralin has been murdered. In a moment, Mr. DeMille presents Act Three of All This in Heaven Two, starring Betty Davis and Charles Boyer. But now, let's talk about Christmas. You know how lovely the Christmas trees in the woods look after a snowstorm, with the delicate frosting of soft white snow on their branches? Wouldn't you like to have a frosty, snow-covered Christmas tree in your living room all through the holiday season? Well, you can. Yes, you can make wonderful, long-lasting, real-looking snow for your tree out of Lux Flakes, the same pure white flakes that you use for washing all your pretty things. It's a lot of fun to do, and it makes a really different and very inexpensive decoration. Here's how you make this Lux snow. Empty a big box of Lux flakes into a large bowl. Then add two cups of warm water, not all at once, but gradually, 
and beat the mixture with an egg beater. Beat it until it's soft and smooth like thick whipped cream. Then take handfuls of this whipped up snow and spread it with your fingers along the branches of your tree. For extra glitter, sprinkle a little shiny artificial snow on top of the Lux snow while it's still damp. Now you can add lights and ornaments or not, just as you wish. You can also make table decorations that look like expensive florist's arrangements by spreading the Lux snow on pine branches and arranging them in vases. Now if you have a mirror over a mantel or a table, put some of the Lux snow covered branches in front of it so you can get double enjoyment by seeing them and their reflection too. Now remember, to make Lux snow, use two cups of warm water to one large box of Lux flakes. Beat with an egg beater till you get a mixture like thick whipped cream that you can spread with your fingers along the branches. Your grocer has printed directions that he'll give you free when you buy Lux flakes to make your Christmas snow. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain rises on the third act of All This and Heaven Too. The classroom in Miss Haynes' school is breathlessly quiet, the girls listening with bowed heads. Mademoiselle D stands very straight, her eyes staring over their heads, far into the past. The gendarmes took the governess away that night to the conciergerie, the prison. They placed her in a cell to be held for questioning. The Duke, too, was being questioned. In his home, the investigating officer sat with him all the night. Just a few more questions, monsieur. Have you any explanation to offer which may account for this tragedy? No. Perhaps an intruder. Yes, that was our first thought, robbery. But since there is nothing missing, we have dismissed it. Had Madame la Duchesse any enemies who might have wished her harm? One does not wish death to anyone. I am not so sure of that, monsieur. Would you care to explain the bloodstains on the clothing which you are wearing? There was blood everywhere. And later, when you came back to your room, you attempted to wash the blood off, did you not? Yes. I wanted to see the children... To tell them, that may heaven help them. Concerning the doors to the Duchess's room, it seems they were locked at first, and then mysteriously they were no longer locked. I must remind you that as a peer of France, I'm not accountable to police officers. How right you are, monsieur. Under the laws of France, you are accountable only to the House of Peers. But I wonder how someone must feel who is not fortunate enough to find herself in such a lofty position. Whom do you mean? What are you leading to? In this case, possibly to the conciergerie. To the cell of a Mademoiselle D. I believe you know her very well, monsieur. She can have no possible connection with this affair. No possible connection. Leave her out of it. You ask me questions, questions, but you won't tell me anything. They brought me to the cell. When was it? Was it yesterday? Won't you tell me anything? The king's prosecutor and I should like to know more concerning your relations with the deceased. From certain testimony, it appears you tried to take from the Duchess the affections of her husband and her children. No, monsieur, I didn't. If the Duchess looked upon me as the cause of her unhappiness, it only shows the workings of a mind that was tortured by horrible and most unreasonable jealousies. If you knew her, if you lived in the same house with her, you would understand... Whatever your interpretation of the relations between you and the Duke de Pralaya... You are referring to certain scandals which were not true. True enough to result in your dismissal. In my leafing. But not in your giving up your influence with some members of that household. How many times have you seen the Duke since then? Three times. Alone? With the children. What has become of the children, monsieur? Only answer the questions. Did you see him on the night of August the 17th? Yes, he came with all four of the children. Did you see him alone on that occasion? For a few minutes. Why? In order to console each other in your separation? No, we discussed a letter of recommendation the Duchess had promised me. I do not understand this line of questioning. Have you not learned that there are very grave indications accusing the Duke of having killed his wife? Oh, no, it's impossible. He who could never see one of his children suffer. I don't believe it. He couldn't. He was so gentle. Please, monsieur, listen to me. He could never have done this dreadful thing. But if he should have had any part in it, then it is I who am guilty because I ask too much. He must have gone to her demanding the letter of recommendation the Duchess had promised me. She refused him, and then... There, you see, I am guilty. Write it down there in your records. Guilty. I, I alone, never him. I must implore you, Mr. 
monsieur, for a full and honest confession. Did you commit the crime of which you are accused? Who can say what is a crime? Do you dare to affirm that you are not guilty? Since you have come here with a conviction of my guilt, nothing I might say would change your opinion. We, your friends, would like to believe that you were pushed into such a barbarous act by a passion which you now regret. Were you not urged by the evil advice of someone else, some woman? No. I received no advice from anyone. One does not give advice for such a thing. Monsieur, we know that Henriette de Luzy could not have been here on that fateful night. But her influence was here. Only say that you were forced to do it. And perhaps you will save yourself. Certainly you will save the throne and the aristocracy. What is one woman's life against these? You make me ashamed that I know you. Monsieur, what were your relations with Henriette de Luzy? She was one's governess to my children. And to you, monsieur? She was my children's governess. She gave them the love that had been denied them. But to you, yourself? Once, she saved my son's life. Did you know that? How queerly we reward those who have been faithful. We demand an honest answer to a plain question. Did you love this woman? Love? Do you know the meaning of the word? I believe we are all thinking of the same thing. Hmm. I did not love her. Very well, monsieur. If we cannot have the truth from you, we will have it from the girl. She is to be questioned again this afternoon, this time before the House of Peers. I call your attention, Mademoiselle de Luzy, to the fact that in your first questioning, you made a most violent avowal of your own guilt in this crime. I said I should not have asked for the letter. I should have accepted my fate, and that I was guilty. When you sent the Duke for the letter... I did not send him. I begged him to forget it. So much the worse for both of you. So much more it demonstrates the power you held over him, which could only have resulted from the guilty passion that was between you. We always return to that, don't we, monsieur? Yes, and we will always return to it. Then I will tell you again. I did not bring sin into that home. I would not have done it if only only out of respect for the children. They were like my own, though perhaps I was wrong to think of them like that. Can't you understand that it is possible to love honestly? Can you call it an honest love when it results in a violent crime and death? Yes, monsieur, it was honest. There was never anything evil between the Duke and myself in the past, and there was no future evil intended. Mademoiselle de Luzy, I have news for you that will make you speak. What more can I say? I advise you to prepare yourself for a shock. The Duke de Prelin has taken poison. poison. Oh, no! Yes, Mademoiselle. Oh, poison. no! Even now, he is dying in the most painful agony. His act can have but one meaning, that he admits his guilt. But to you, to you, it must have a frightful significance, and I ask you to consider it. Plainly, Mademoiselle, he deserts you. I call upon you now to denounce this man who betrayed you. Rebuke his cowardice by the courage of your confession. I do not know by what means you have driven him to his terrible act. I do not know if he has, as you say, abandoned me. I can only tell you what I have said before. If you refuse to speak, you drive me to a course which I hope to avoid. <laughs> that of taking you to that house and bringing the two of you face to face. I beg you, monsieur. Do you wish to speak? Only for him. If he is dying, at least have the pity to let him die in peace. Summon carriages. Order a large guard. It will be needed. <laughs> Monsieur, we are here to question you for the last time. I, I haven't the strength to say anything. We only want a yes or a no. Are you guilty in the murder of your wife? To some questions, there is no yes or no. Your suicide is your answer. Was it not your guilty entanglement with Henriette de Luzy that drove you to the madness that possessed you? My strength fails me some of the time. Bring the girl in. Huh? Have you put her here? You still have a chance to speak, monsieur. Stand there, mademoiselle, by the bed. Monsieur, you go to meet your creator. Look at this woman and tell us the truth. Did you love her? I... I cannot answer any more questions. Did you love this woman? Will you never be satisfied? I am dying. What more do you want of me? Then the last chance comes to you, mademoiselle. Is there anything you wish to say to this man? There is nothing... I need to say. It is useless to try further. May God have mercy on your soul, monsieur. Take the girl away. Pierre, where are you? I am here, monsieur. Oh, 
Lean close. Listen carefully. You are the only one that I can trust. Oui, monsieur. There is little time. I want you to tell her something. Why I took poison. She may think that I was afraid, but I was not afraid for myself. Do you understand? No, monsieur. You heard them. Did you love her? Did you love her? I could not have borne it for long. I would have said it to their faces. Yes, yes, I love her. With every drop of blood in me, I worship her. If I had lived, she would have been condemned to death. And so I chose to die. My only regret is that I have offended my creator. And of him, I ask forgiveness. But except for that, I have no regrets. I loved her. I loved her. I will tell her, monsieur. Yes. Yes, Pierre, you tell her. Say the words that I could never say to her. Perhaps she knew. I think so. I think she knew. They can never harm her. Mademoiselle de Luzy was freed at last. She was free of every prison except that of her memories. The Duke was dead, and she wished she might die too, but that was not possible. She had to go on living, facing the future. And what future was there for her in a place where she was hated, where the crowds on the street would gladly have torn her apart? I cannot tell you her emotions as she approached this strange new country. Suppose the terrible things that she wished so much to forget should follow her. People can be as cruel in one country as in another. They find copies of old newspapers and stir up what is best forgotten. They can exchange sly glances and whispers. And although they perhaps mean no harm, the ugly story spreads and grows until there is no peace for her. Not even in America. Oh, mademoiselle, please don't go on. Please. It is for you to tell me the end of my story. You girls who faced your own lives are to decide mine. You, Emily Schuyler. Now that I have spelled conciergerie for you, is there anything more you would like to know? I'm sure you'd like to ask some questions. I... I have no questions, mademoiselle. Then do you think this governess deserves to suffer the rest of her life? Or do you think she has earned the right to continue her work in this country where so many before her have taken refuge? I think that... Oh, mademoiselle, forgive me. We want you to stay. All of us want you to stay. I thank you. I thank all of you. From my heart. Our stars will be back in just a moment for their curtain calls. And now, as each day brings Christmas nearer, I can hear something like this in many homes. There's Jane. Now, what shall I give her? And Ellen? Aunt Mary? Oh, yes, and young Betty. I know, they'd all like stockings this year. Yes, that's a gift that every girl will welcome. This year, more than ever, stockings. But ladies, when you lift them out of their Christmas wrappings, make yourself a promise to give those precious stockings the gentle care they deserve so they'll last and look lovely for a long, long time. Give them gentle lux care after every wearing. Here's what happens when you lux stockings each night. First, you remove the soil and perspiration that can weaken the fibers. Second, you save the elasticity that makes stockings fit and wear. You've seen a rubber band all dried out, its elasticity gone. It breaks at a touch. Well, your sheer stockings break easily, too, when elasticity is gone. Then, runs pop. So it's important to save stocking elasticity with gentle Lux care. And new quick Lux flakes are so fast. Why, in water as cool as your hand, they suds three times as fast as any of ten other popular soaps tested. They're thrifty, too. A big box does stockings for weeks. Now, don't forget, stockings are precious. 
Lux yours every night. And with stockings and lingerie you give to others, send along a box of gentle Lux flakes. It's a thoughtful touch that's really appreciated. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. There will always be new thrills in the theater, as long as great artists like Betty Davis and Charles Boyer have the stage. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. It's a great pleasure to be back again. And I don't need to tell you, C.B., how any actor would feel about playing opposite Betty Davis. <laughs> All this in heaven, too, had an absolutely real quality, Charles. The people seemed so real. Perhaps there's a very good reason for that, Mr. DeMille. In all essential details, All This in Heaven, too, is a true story. The character, Henriette Desportes, was a great aunt of Miss Rachel Field, who wrote the book. Yes, and the case of the Duc de Pralin is very famous in the annals of the Paris police. Mm, no wonder the story rings true. But personally, I think much of the credit should go to both of you. Well, that's very kind of you, C.B. Let's see, next week will be your Christmas play, won't it? Yes, we, we celebrate Christmas week with the paramount hit, Remember the Night. And the stars who will celebrate with us are Gene Arthur and Fred McMurray. It's a gay yet strangely dramatic love story that'll thrill everyone who has ever felt the longing for home at Christmas time. So remember the night next Monday night for our Christmas play with Fred McMurray and Gene Arthur and Beulah Bondi. I'm sure it'll be a fine performance, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. I wish Santa Claus would give me you two stars in the picture. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, directly following the Lux Radio Theater, I urge you to listen to a special broadcast that will include an address by the President of the United States celebrating the 150th anniversary of the American Bill of Rights. It's the Bill of Rights which guarantees us such things as freedom of worship, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press. To ensure these privileges for all time, we are now engaged in a great world war. And today we pause for a moment in humble thanks for the liberty bestowed by the Bill of Rights. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gene Arthur and Fred McMurray with Beulah Bandy in Remember the Night. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> and now I want to read to you a message from the United States Treasury Department. Quote, Today, America, united as never before in her history, takes up the challenge of war. Without you, your individual effort, America's answer to the invader is less strong. Think about that. It's true. Here's one way that you can help. Buy United States defense bonds and stamps. Buy them every payday hereafter. Buy them as Christmas gifts. A share in America for your family, your children, your friends. An investment in your future, too. In 10 years, you get all the money you paid for them, plus as much as 33 and a third percent more in interest. And if you need money at any time, you can exchange your stamps or bonds for cash. You don't have to keep them until maturity unless you are able to. But the longer you keep them, the more they earn. Now here's what the thousands of men and women who helped to make Lux and Lux toilet soap did. They asked their company to put part of their pay each week into these bonds and stamps for national defense. This is called the payroll allotment plan, and you can start a plan of this kind yourself. Do it tomorrow. Ask your employer to help you arrange it. That will show the world that Americans are backing their country regularly all the way. The Treasury Department's communication goes on to say, quote, And now, on behalf of Henry Morgenthau, Jr., Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, the Treasury Department wishes to express its sincere thanks to the employees and the management of Lever Brothers Company for their splendid cooperation with the Treasury Department's payroll allotment plan. As early as last May, the makers of Lux and Lux Toilet Soap adopted the plan and have been faithfully carrying it through ever since. Today, they are glad to have been the first in their district to have done this and they are more enthusiastic than ever over the payroll allotment plan. Remember, the regular systematic buying of defense bonds and stamps is for the defense of every one of us. Betty Davis appeared tonight through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio and will soon be seen in their production of The Man Who Came to Dinner. Charles Boyer's current picture is the universal production Appointment for Love. 
heard in tonight's play were B. Benaderet as the Duchess, Edgar Barrier as Bruce Zay, and Jeff Corey as DeLonghi. Tune in next Monday night to hear Fred McMurray and Gene Arthur with Beulah Bondi in Remember the Night. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.